name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Glory to Jesus Christ. Glory forever. This is the gospel that I frequently tell people to read, probably more times over the years than any other, because... Of course, everybody is worrying about something, especially now it seems more than ever with viruses and civil unrest. If you can call such a thing civil, I'm not sure you can. It's a strange usage of the word. You don't know what it means. Um, but God gives us another way. He tells us to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. He tells us not to worry about tomorrow. He tells us not to worry about eating and drinking and clothes. And we have two reactions to this, Metropolitan Anthony of Soros had several things to say about that. We have the reaction of, that sounds nice, that would be very nice not to worry about things and just simply not worry and God's going to provide. But somewhere inside of us there's that other reaction if we are honest with ourselves that that sounds nice but that's impossible. I've got too much to worry about, too much to do. I've got to take care of too many things. So to do that takes a radical change of life, a very radical change of life, he says. And that's to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And his righteousness is one of love and one of unity and one that follows those commandments of loving God with all our mind, with all our heart, with all our strength, with all our soul, and loving our neighbor as ourself. Those are terms we throw around a lot, but we don't really focus on them in our own lives. We say God is love, and this is true, and that the greatest commandment is to love, but little focus do we give to that, to loving one another and to loving God. Because as St. John of the Latter says, fire quenches fire, and what he means by that is that our fire of love for God quenches natural loves, or natural loves that are distorted because of passions and sin. The more we love God, the more we fall in love with God, the more we focus on that. And if you'll notice these great saints who didn't have so many worries, I think of St. Sergius, for example, who tells his people, his monks, not to worry about food coming, and they were practically at the point of rebellion when all the food would show up, because he was focusing primarily on God and everything he did. When we do that, when we focus on the needs of our neighbors, somehow our neighbors' needs become more important than our needs, and we start to worry about them, not worry, but to try to take care of them, to be focused on that. And it's amazing how much our heart changes when we seek first the kingdom of God. It's a radical way of life, the gospel. It's a strange way of life, a peculiar people, as it says, but we have to try to live that way. I came across the other day a talk from Father Nikolai Sakharov, if that last name rings a bell, maybe it doesn't, but if it does, it's the same last name as Father Sophroni, St. Sophroni, it's his nephew, and uh, he was a monk of that monastery, he was somewhat of a theologian. The talk he gave at St. Tikhon's a few years ago, and he talked about Father Sophroni's emphasis on life, and Father Sophroni, probably more than any theologian, Ever. He emphasized personhood, meaning not being individuals, but people in communion, being real persons. Now, hypostasis is where he said one that is totally living in God, living in each other. But he said that Father Sophroni really emphasized, yes, the fathers talk about being in the image of God, but they don't often talk about it as being in the image of the Holy Trinity and what the, the implications of that are. And St. Sophroni did so. Our theology matters. The dogmas matter. Christianity without dogmas is not Christianity, it's certainly without right dogmas. Because they are the healing prescriptions of God, and everything changes. We could do a long talk on that when, distor when distortions come into the spiritual life. But Father Sophroni emphasized this because he pointed out in our reactions and living with each other and our neighbor and how to love our neighbor, we are to be as the Holy Trinity. No one is greater, no one is lesser. Imagine if we lived that way with everyone around us, that not one soul in this room was greater than the other, and not one was lesser than the other. They all treat each other as equal, with love. And they also, each of the persons of the Trinity is love, and comprised of love and relation to the other, and 
vice versa, going back toward the others, all with love. There's also that theological term you didn't use, perichoris, is this interworking and working together in everything. Notice that the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit do everything together, working together in concert with one another. And we need to try to live that way as united beings in Christ. And yes, there are things, differences we're going to have. And yes, there are differences in the outside world around us. And yes, there are opinions that are different than ours. So maybe they're right, maybe they're wrong. And yes, there are people fighting each other over all kinds of political issues and everything else. But I can assure you they're all approaching it the wrong way, not with the gospel. The emphasis needs to be on Christ, that who Christ is, and living in the image of the Holy Trinity. It's okay to disagree with one another, but not with hatred and not with anger. Anger is always, in our cases, sin. A righteous anger does exist, but how many of us have ever really experienced that? I dare to say probably none. That's, that's a rare, rare gift. And so, we must look at each other as brothers with love. Imagine what that would change around the world. It doesn't mean everybody gets their way. No, it certainly never means that. Often we don't get our way, but it can lead to humility. St. Sophronia also emphasized God as humility, which is something not many people talked about before. But he is the image of humility, the Holy Trinity. Notice how they're interworking again. No one takes precedence. God the Father does beget the Son. God the Father does give procession to the Holy Spirit. But they're still equal. They all have the same nature. Father Sophroni also emphasized, as much as anything in his monastery, unity. And that's what we need to have in parishes. Wish we could have in the outside world, but that's probably utopia. That's not really realistic. But we can strive for that in our parishes. And it was strived for so much by Father Sophroni, it was emphasized over everything that he would never tolerate a harsh word against another in the monastery or condemnation. Father Nikolai talked about that one time he was first at the monastery, all of a sudden, didn't happen often, St. Sophronia often talked to the monks, of course, but he called an emergency meeting, called it an emergency meeting, and they met together, and Father Sophronia said that one of the monks had talked insultingly about another monk, and this was an emergency, because what it did was it divided in the body, even in the thoughts, he said, it divides the body, it divides each other from one another. And how can we seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness when we have resentments and condemnation? How can we not worry about food and drink when our hearts are so overwhelmed with people around us? We're not worried about God and loving each other. It can't be done. So he has an absolute correct emphasis. One of our brothers in Christ, John, died on reposing the Lord better. Death is a lie, as the fathers say. Repose from the Lord on Friday. We still don't know the reason. I'm in contact with his wife and they're looking into that. I was shocked by how many people didn't know who he was when I said it. It made me sad. Yes, he hadn't been here long, but he was chrismated in January and married in February. And the thing that revealed to me is, as I said it before in sermons, and I'm sure I'm guilty of it too, but we do tend to clump in groups in the social hall or leave immediately and not get to know the new people. I've had people here before tell me this church isn't friendly, people don't talk to you. There are individuals, absolutely, who do come talk your ear off. That's probably a good thing. I remember a church I know of in this country that grows all the time, and one thing that's said about that church is there's never a time when someone visits that 10 people don't invite them out to lunch afterwards or something like that. And that's a good and beautiful thing. That was the way when I first came into Orthodox. I remember it vividly. Every weekend there was a different family wanting to get to know you. And if you didn't get to know John, please pray for him. Please pray for the repose of his soul and his family. But I'm going to tell you, you missed out on something. Because I, I enjoyed him immensely, personally immensely. So it was a big shock to me. It hurt. It hurt badly. Because John was one of the few people here that ever say concerned about me. And that meant a lot. I'm sure some of you are. I'm sure, I'm sure all of you are, really. And he, in his lawyer kind of way, 
which it was, would cry. And guess what? He got Father Cyprian's answers. He got coy, he got quiet, he got in God's time, God's will, those kind of things. That's what you're going to get through most of the time. But I appreciated the sentiment. He wanted to know who I was. And I wanted to know who he was. And I learned a lot about him. He's very open with me. And it was a beautiful thing. I talked to his wife yesterday, too, because we have unity with her as well. And she's part of our body we must love as the image of the Trinity. And I said, what a beautiful thing. John's last six months of his life, he entered the fullness of the truth of the church. He entered into Christ's church. He confessed to me less than a month ago. Nice confession on the phone, what we could do. He was in contact with me rather regularly. He got married in the church. He was participating in the classes we had online and things like that. And I can tell you he really cared and was happy to be a part of the church. So now that John has reposed with the Lord does not mean that he is separated from us as images of the Trinity. It means that bond of love we have with him continues. We must continue to pray for him, for him, diligently. Diligently. As hopefully he'll pray for us at some point. Let's pray for the repose of his soul. Pray for this, this difficult time as the fathers teach of judgment after death, that he passes through that time to the bosom of Abraham. It's our prayer that God will receive him in mercy. And God is always merciful. And God, John's heart was inclined that way, certainly, toward the end of his life. So pray for him and pray for one another. But listen to the words of the Lord. Do not worry so much about food and drink. Because if you have excess food and drink, that's some food and drink that someone else doesn't have, and clothes that someone else doesn't have. That's not showing love. If you're doing something that is not out of love for God, you're holding something back from the kingdom of God and His righteousness. And you have to add fire to fire, to quench fire with fire, as St. John says. So keep that thought in mind as you go about, not only today, but throughout your lives, really, but through this week, try to that we are images of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. We are to not be greater than anyone or lesser than anyone, but to be the servants of all, and to strive to love each other in unity and bonds. And if we have a difficulty with someone else, we'll talk to them out of love for them. And all these things will be added unto us if we do those things. And people will flock here because they will sense our love. Amen. Amen.